People ask me, why are we programming in machine language? If you write an interpreter, a compiler, or an assembler, then you're in the business of translating a higher language into machine language, or toward machine language. That's how I got here. I was writing a fourth system with a simple interpreter and a simple compiler. I was using an assembler to write this fourth system, and I didn't like using an assembler. I still had to read the Intel manual to know the available instructions, and whatever arithmetic was done on the labels by the assembler, I felt it should be done by my fourth system. The Intel manual is big and unwieldy, but the writers are trying to describe the effect of each instruction down to the bit. For clarity, I am willing to give up some conveniences. We can build the conveniences ourselves. And as we go down this path, we find we haven't given up so much. The basic elements of programming languages, conditionals, loops, and function calls, are there in the CPU instruction set. Whether you're like me and you want to avoid the complexity of the usual tools from the world of C, or whether you enjoy using the C tools and you want to understand what they do at the lowest level, we can do it by writing programs in machine language. In the first video, we saw how to get a Linux system to accept a binary file as an executable. In the second video, we saw how to invoke a system call, where to find information about machine instructions, and how to arrange an executable that prints Hello World. In this video, we make a loop in a program that prints Hello World repeatedly. We copy the Hello World program from the last video. We remove the sizes from the ELF program header. A label marks the beginning of the loop. The idea is that after Hello World is printed, we want the processor to jump backward in the stream of instructions to a place just before where Hello World is printed. At the end of the loop, we jump to label begin. But the machine doesn't know about this label begin. In the Intel manual, we find the instruction jump rel8 opcode ebcb, where cb is a code offset byte. This instruction jumps a short distance forward or backward in the instruction stream. Byte counts after the newly inserted instruction are invalid. And the buffer has moved. The program is complete now, except for a few blanks. When we run it, it will go on printing Hello World forever. There's a syscall exit that will never be reached, but we'll leave that in there. Where does the buffer begin? From byte count 6a, here after the write syscall, there are 14 bytes before the string hello world. 6a plus 14 equals 7, 8. The buffer is 10 bytes long. 7, 8 plus 10 is 8, 2. And we fill in the program size. 8, 2 minus 5, 4 is 2, E. It remains to fill in the code offset byte of the jump. This code offset is a signed 8-bit integer representing the displacement delta of the jump in bytes, measured from where the next instruction after the jump instruction begins. Positive deltas are forward, negative deltas are backward. CB is the 2's complement encoding of delta. These pairs are congruent modulo 2 to the 8th in the sense of modular arithmetic. Our jump is backward in the stream of instructions. We can get the displacement by counting bytes, it's minus 24 bytes from the end of the loop after the jump instruction to the beginning, or by computing the difference in byte counts. The byte count after the jump instruction is 6c, and before the loop is 54. That's minus 1, 8, which is congruent to 1 plus ff minus 1, 8, modulo 2 to the 8. To compute the 1's complement in binary, you just flip the bits. Or to compute the 1's complement in hexadecimal, it's an easy subtraction with no borrowing. ff minus 1, 8 is e7. Then to get the 2's complement, you add 1, e8. Or 54 minus 6c is congruent to 154 minus 6c modulo 2 to the 8th equals e8. 
we write E8 in the blank, make the executable in the same old way, and it works. Can we tighten the loop? Each time through the loop, we are setting four registers to the same four values for a write syscall. The system leaves a return code in register EAX at the end of the syscall, but it leaves the other registers as they were. So we can set them once before the loop and get the same behavior. Now the begin label is nine bytes back from after the jump. The two's complement of 0, 09 is 1 plus F6 equals F7. It still works. Can we arrange that the program halts itself after a few times through the loop? We can keep count in another register. EDI is available. We insert an instruction to set EDI to some number, say 5. This invalidates the byte counts, the address of the buffer, and the program length. Conditional jumps are listed under JCC in the instruction set reference. We replace this unconditional jump with the conditional jump JNZ, jump short if not zero, opcode 75CB. Inside the loop, we decrement the loop counter. There is an instruction sub rm32 im32 to subtract an immediate value. Shorter, an instruction sub rm32 im8, and even shorter, an instruction dec r32. The insertion of this one byte invalidates the jump offset. Let's revise it in place. f7 becomes f6. So how does this work? When the processor reaches instruction J and Z, a jump is executed if the zero flag has value zero. Otherwise, a jump is not executed, and execution continues past the jump statement. But what ties the zero flag to our counter register EDI? Who produces flags? Instruction test looks at a particular register and sets some flags. Instruction CMP is an arithmetic comparison that subtracts the second operand from the first sets some flags, and discards the difference. The subtract instruction also affects some flags. And even instruction dec affects the zero flag. A dec instruction is right here before instruction j and z. There are no instructions in between to change the value of the zero flag. When execution reaches instruction j and z, the zero flag was last touched by an instruction that looks at register EDI and sets the zero flag accordingly. We make the binary, and it works. We can change the initial count to 3, and it still works. You can read more about flags in the Intel Manual, Volume 1, Section 3.4.3, .3, and the instruction set reference mentions when an instruction uses flags. If you followed the discussion of loops, I think you know how to arrange conditional statements, like an if-else statement. If condition A holds, then block B is executed, else block C is executed. The first line, if condition A, is implemented in two parts. First a test that produces a flag, then a conditional jump that consumes the flag. At the end of block B goes an unconditional jump to avoid block C. And that's it.